Avete tutti preso i caffè necessari per affrontare la giornata? Sì? No? Vabbè, recupereremo il break delle, delle 11 perché ci sarà... In realtà in break bisognerebbe farli prima di iniziare. Cioè bisognerebbe arrivare, trovare il buffet, uno si prende il caffè, poi dopo inizia, fa una mezz'oretta di lavoro e un paio d'ore di break. Questo... Allora, iniziamo questa sessione che ha come focus il blended, blended learning, è um, uno dei temi sui quali la SIREM, la società italiana di ricerca sull'educazione mediale, sta lavorando molto, questa sessione è organizzata appunto dalla, dalla SIREM, eh, il blended come sapete perché parlo di un pubblico di esperti è probabilmente la modalità di learning che è in maggiore crescita, sviluppo in tutto il mondo, sicuramente in Europa. Eh, stanno emergendo anche politiche per regolamentare il blended nei diversi paesi perché ovviamente ci sono delle riflessioni non solo sulla ehm, come dire, modalità corretta, didattica, pedagogica per fornire lezioni a distanza ma ci sono ovviamente eh, molte riflessioni in corso eh, sui temi della quality assurance, cioè sulla qualità dell'erogazione di questi contenuti anche perché i eh, soggetti che iniziano ad offrire eh, blended learning sono sempre di più eterogenei, diversi, molteplici e quindi c'è uno sforzo anche di regolamentazione delle politiche del blended learning molto interessante in questi mesi, in questi anni che si sta sviluppando a livello di agenzie nazionali di quality assurance e agenzie europee ovviamente di quality assurance oggi abbiamo due interventi molto importanti, significativi, eh, di due colleghi che avranno due visioni diverse ma in qualche modo credo anche complementari, quindi eh, vedremo un punto di vista della eh, University College of Dublin eh, e il punto di vista invece dell'Università di Firenze, quindi il punto di vista di una collega italiana. Eh, la SIREM, la Società Italiana di Ricerca sull'Educazione Mediale per chi non lo sapesse, è eh, la società italiana che riunisce eh, studiosi, ricercatori di educazione mediale, siamo circa un centinaio, la SIREM è nata eh, 11 anni fa ormai, e non è tantissimo, ma nel tempo rapido della rivoluzione digitale sembra quasi un'eternità, perché i, i temi dei, intorno ai quali eh, come dire, lavoravamo dieci anni fa ormai sono stati superati dalle evoluzioni tecnologiche, dalla trasformazione che tutti noi stiamo vivendo e noi cerchiamo di tenere il passo di questi cambiamenti mantenendo attento eh, lo sguardo sull'innovazione sull tecnologica, sull'innovazione pedagogica e didattica che si possono eh, attuare nei contesti di educazione e di istruzione. Ehm, L'intervento di oggi, il seminario di oggi è organizzato dicevo, dalla SIREM eh, la eh, referente della SIREM per noi in questo contesto è la professoressa Falcinelli che ringrazio che mi ha ceduto il coordinamento per affetto, credo eh, <ride> e quindi io ricambio l'affetto e sono qui a, a coordinare quindi non dico molto altro se non che ehm, questo è un piccolo spoiler di quello che intendiamo fare come Università di Foggia nei prossimi anni noi stiamo cercando di attivare un dottorato, cercando, quindi metto qualche cautela, stiamo cercando di attivare un dottorato di ricerca insieme con una serie di altri Atenei, con altri partner, un dottorato di ricerca in e-learning. Eh, credo che in questo momento in Italia non ci sia un dottorato di ricerca con questa specifica connotazione, eh, quindi approfitto anche di questa eh, platea così eh, qualificata per eh, lanciare l'idea per chi voglia aggregarsi in questo progetto quindi costruire insieme a noi eh, un eh, percorso di dottorato sull'Iler noi siamo felici di eh, come dire, aprire questa strada eh, è un'iniziativa che nasce come sede amministrativa eh, presso l'università di Foggia ma è come dire, nata nelle discussioni appunto della SIREM, sui tavoli appunto della Società Italiana di Educazione Mediale eh, e credo che potrà essere particolarmente utile per formare le nuove generazioni di studiosi che andranno ad investigare temi come questo, come i blended, che sono oggetto oggi della nostra riflessione. Quindi passo subito la parola al collega, gli interventi saranno circa di una mezz'oretta ciascuno e poi... Eh, 
pochissimi minuti, purtroppo perché i tempi sono contingentati e continuiamo a iniziare in ritardo, pochissimi minuti di confronto, dibattito, scambio alla fine del, degli interventi. Approfitto per salutare l'amico Paolo Ferri, ciao. slides. Good morning. Can I start with a greeting, please? I bring you greetings from the Educational Studies Association of Ireland. Um, we have watched your conference with great interest in the last couple of years. It is a real pleasure to be here finally. Thank you, oh, Professor yeah. Porpil, thank you for, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, the apology is to do with the fact that I have very little Italian. My Italian is so bad that I would not even attempt to use it. So I'm, I'm afraid today's presentation will be in bad English instead of bad Italian. Okay. I've been asked to speak to the idea of knowledge and learning in the digital age and to give you some thoughts, some personal perspectives, some reflections that fit with the theme of the conference. I'm happy to do so, but we have something of a problem. If you were to talk intelligently to people, you need to understand the people you are talking with, you need to understand the context in which they work, and you need to understand their concerns. I love Italy, I visit very regularly, but I am not an expert on the use of technologies or didactics in the Italian setting and context. So please forgive me if I make some spectacularly silly um, errors in today's presentation. I do, however, know about Ireland. Um, for those of you who have not visited, please come. It is a small country, like Italy. We are a republic. We're much smaller. The population of Rome and Milan altogether would make up the population of Ireland. We're about 70,000 square kilometers. It's very beautiful kilometers, lots of sheep, lots of mountains. Um, and we have a GDP of about 217 billion US dollars. We are also very digital. All of the main new technology companies have their European base or a major European office in Ireland somewhere. Most in Dublin, many in Cork and Limerick also. So, this makes Ireland an interesting place when it comes to technologies and the use of technologies in teaching and learning. We are a small, open economy. If we do not trade with the world, we will not survive. We are the second most global economy in the world. You will notice that I've mentioned the word economy twice. The connections between learning, technology, and economy are profoundly important in Ireland. And to my mind, they are not always good connections. I will say something about that as I speak. We are European and proud to be European. The Brits can leave, we are staying. <laughs> um, education, however, is an issue because I ask a simple question. Is education a European Union competency? Is it an area that the European Union has competency, control, governance in? What do you reckon? The answer is no. Officially, it is not. But that did not stop a group of people getting together in Lisbon. You might recognize one face here, at least. 
in 2001. It did not stop them making a huge claim for the importance of education and the fact that the European Centre in Brussels should have a major say in the education systems of the world. The Lisbon Agenda, you are all familiar with. I'm not going to go into it very uh, much. But it does connect education to economy in a way that we have not previously seen in our, our experiences. In fact, it's a kind of a political grab. This is a slide from a European website that was launched last year. The Commission indicates its intention to promote open, innovative teaching, learning through technology. The connection is there in the minds of the European Commission. And it is important to acknowledge that because it's not going to go away. More recently in Dublin, we had a senior European um, civil servant, Cecile Leclerc, speaking about the fact that education, after the meeting in Copenhagen last year, the Commission is now taking an interest in education in schools as well as in universities and higher education. The, we are moving towards what is described as the European Common Education Area. There are wonderful opportunities here for different types of learning, included blended and um, um, mixed abilities learning. But we have a couple of challenges to face. The leaders in this discussion have not been the pedagogical community. The leaders have not been associations like this and associations like mine. The leaders in the conversation have been from the technology industries. This is good, it's also bad. They have very, very powerful levels of interest and influence in the Commission. They have fundamentally changed the meaning of the word knowledge and the meaning of the activity of learning. You look at something like this and you ask the question, has knowledge changed over time? Could this picture have been taken 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago? The answer is yes and no. I would suggest that knowledge itself has probably not changed very much. What has changed is how we mobilize it and how we use it. And in the modern era, we're using it in very, very different ways. What has changed is how we gather and gain knowledge. The media, the modes through which we learn, particularly in universities. Universities globally are going through a huge transformation. We have not seen anything like this since around 1500, 1600, when the present day universities started to form. We are seeing changes in relation to the ethics, the moral values of education. Different understandings of what it is to be an intelligent and educated person are celebrated now than in the past. We are seeing society rewarding knowledge in different ways. Hands up if you are a very, very rich educationalist. There are not too many hands going up. I think that was an accident. She didn't. Okay. Um, we are not rewarded terribly well. But there are a lot of people in the technology industry, for example, and in the biotechnology industry that are rewarded incredibly well for their knowledge and so on. So what has changed really is to do with values, capabilities, and performance. And I'm involved with Professor Floriana in a project that is looking at this whole area the construction of professional knowledge, the values that underpin it, and the capabilities that we want from young teachers going into the field. It is very, very challenging. And I'm hoping that my colleague, Professor Maria, will say something about the Italian context in relation to those challenges and blended learning in her part of the conversation. I would point just to this picture, and I would say two things. The values that we are encountering more frequently in the world are values to do with a new elite. It is a global rising middle class. They are come from nowhere. They could be from 
Firenze, they could be from Tullamore, they could be from London, they could be from Berlin. They have no real home, but they are at home in the modern world. They are urban, they are technocratic, and they are very materialistic. It's all about making a living. It's all about the money. Um, they exist in every, this group of people exist in every country, but they belong to none. Essentially, the belief system that they adhere to comes from the idea of the knowledge economy. To be educated is to be ready for the knowledge economy. The values that drive this knowledge economy are not neutral, they are political. And they are not, in the main, I would suggest, educational. There are some elements of education, but they are much, much more to do with something different. Because around 1969, something fundamentally changed. Have you seen this picture before? Do you recognize it? A few will. A few of us were probably even there. Okay. This is the original internet. That is the original ARPANET schematic, done on the back of a piece of paper. A number of nodes, a number of links. Fundamentally, the world changed because of the networked, the rhizomic network nature of what has happened consequently. Society has become reorganized around networks of influence, of knowledge, of understanding, of power, and of governance. We see new forms of social capital. We see the rise of the creative class. We see the emergence of entrepreneurial skills associated with technology in the past 30 or 40 years in ways we've never seen previously. Technology is the solution. No. Technology is part of the solution, but it is not the solution. It is not a silver bullet, and all of us in this room know that. But it's very, very hard to convince policymakers and politicians. They will sing the same song. Oh yes, technology will be the solution all the time. It is very different. So I will not speak very much about the forces that are driving this other than to say that they are economic. They are to do with new ways of governing and understanding and they are to do with new understandings of capitalism and what it is to be rewarded for the work, the labor that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is where it comes from. There are not too many universities. Do you see your university there? No. It's not been led by the universities. It's been led by the big international, supranational corporations and um, the, the, the technology companies generally. This is a man that I would not like to meet, not like to know personally, but he makes a very interesting observation. He says, we must not allow the new technology to deeply rebrand tyranny and liberty. His position is from the far right, but he's actually correct in what he is saying. I don't like his politics, but I do accept the truth of the comment he makes. It's not all bad, it's not all disaster, it's not all sinking ships. And I'm into my last five minutes, if, if you can stay with me. There is some very, very wonderful stuff happening, and it's because of people like the people in this room. It's because of educators, teachers, researchers that are interested in this area and that are trying to humanize, keep the human touch in the education of the newer world. The big challenge we face is that there's a huge emphasis on know-how. Everything is about knowing how, technique, competence, okay? There's much less emphasis on other profoundly important elements of human learning. The inner values of knowing, creativity in all its forms. The fact that we can now learn in so many different ways, you do not have to go to a library no matter how beautiful. The library is in your pocket. So this is all changing in a radical way. Popper, in about 1972, made an interesting comment. He said, the process of learning, the growth of subjective knowledge is always fundamentally the same. It is imaginative 
criticism. The danger is the types of learning that are valued in the world today do not put enough emphasis on this profoundly important educational quality. We have seen all sorts of examples in Ireland, and I've gone through them very quickly there, of changes in relation to education and educational practices. We have seen all sorts of new presences, parents becoming involved in teaching coding. This is a recent development in Ireland, and we're seeing the same thing all over Europe. Teachers becoming involved in maker spaces and learning through doing and making. Projects like, as I say, the one that we have been involved in, the ITE Lab, where you listen to the voice of those that you want to work with. You listen to the voice of the teachers. You put the teachers in the same room as the technologists, and we educate each other. It is a two-way conversation. It has to be two-way. They are not going away. Neither are we. So education and technology meet, talk, and we come up with better ways of thinking in terms of critical, creative, participatory education. This is my favorite metaphor for education. Take pieces, build them into something beautiful. Use your skills, use your creativity, use your technical knowledge. This is one of my favorite writers. Always has been, and I think always will be. All right? The idea that something can be eternal and at the same time ever-changing. It's a beautiful metaphor for education and for what we do in higher education particularly. We're doing the same as we always have, but we're doing it very differently. We are preserving what Zizic calls the old within the new conditions. And that's my summary. I will leave the slides with you. I think it is interesting that an anonymous person in Berlin writing a blog about two years ago could say something so profound. Knowledge does not simply exist. It's not just there. It has to be produced, adapted, forgotten, rejected, superseded, reconfigured. Knowledge is a living thing. Learning is the process through which we acquire and pass that knowledge from generation to generation. And the final line, knowledge is central to the most purposive of human practices. We are in danger of losing that, colleagues, unless we keep a very, very close eye on the process. Um, that's my short message. I hope there has been something to encourage you to think and to engage. And I do apologize for speaking so quickly but I want to make sure that my colleague has sufficient time to um, s offer her contribution also. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we, have, if we wish to open up the discussion now or maybe we could listen to the other presentation and uh, yeah, maybe it's better. So thank you for your point of view, your critical presentation, it's opening up a lot of uh, uh, thoughts. Uh,